So Colleen is the director, <laughs> uh, the senior director of research and development at Bay State Milling. Uh, she's responsible for the development and commercialization of new products to support the company growth in uh, plant-based ingredients. Um, Ms. Zammer is joined by joined Bay State Milling in 2010 after 21 years in the food industry in a variety of roles, including product development, market development, and sales leadership. Um, Colleen holds a bachelor in science, a uh, bachelor of science degree in food science from Framingham State University, and is a master of science has a master of science degree in innovation from the Demore McKin McKim School of Business at Northeastern University. We're thrilled to have you, um, Colleen. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, feel free to start the presentation. Okay, thanks, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good to be here today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about supply chain dynamics in the time of COVID-19. And it's sort of a top 10 list format. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, it's in a ascending or descending order, just uh, 10 tips that we've learned as we've gone through this and uh, that we want to share with you today. So real quick, just in case you're not familiar with Bay State Milling, we're a Boston-based family-owned company that's been supplying plant-based food ingredients to manufacturers for more than 120 years. So we cover the gamut um, of seeds, flowers, grains, spices, all kinds of things of that nature. So what I'm gonna be talking to you about today will really come from the perspective of food ingredients, although hopefully will also apply to packaging and other supplies uh, that might be in your supply chain. So generally speaking, food products live and die by, by supply chains. Really, all products do, but it, it's sort of the art and science of delivering food um, to the masses because we have perishable ingredients, we have non-perishable ingredients. So there's a lot to think about in the supply chain and a lot of things that can go wrong in a time when uh, that is absolutely not the norm, particularly when we're looking at global supply chains. So we're gonna hit on a number of different points today that are local and global in nature. First and foremost, establishing relationships with your supplier is really important. And that may seem pretty rudimentary, but um, there are different types of supplier relationships. And it's easy to be forgotten about when you are at this transactional end of the spectrum where you're just, you know, you're buying um, in small quantities, uh, you don't really know, or you're not working with the same company or person all the time. So if you can move yourself to this relational end of the spectrum where you have a personal relationship with a company and a person that you're buying from, because when you have a person to person relationship, they're much more likely to have your back. You're much more, you're much less likely to get forgotten about. So really important to just try to establish that relationship with your suppliers. Secondly, ensuring suppliers understand your inventory needs. Now we all know that forecasting, sales forecasting is very difficult even in normal times. But when we're in abnormal times, transparency is really key. Um, don't assume that your supplier knows what you need because I may be looking at what's happening right now and saying, you know, people are buying familiar foods, they're not buying brand new things that might be in a natural food store, you know, they're kind of going for comfort foods. So I may be assuming that a new product that's really innovative uh, really natural, isn't selling well, so you might not need something. But you, in the background, may be pivoting to e-commerce, which is really doing well for this type of product right now, uh, and your needs are going to grow. So we just need to be keeping, uh, keeping each other in the loop so that we can make sure that we're supplying what you need when you need it. Next is understanding where your supplies are coming from. We are in a global food economy, and food comes from all different corners of the globe. Uh, and right now, this pandemic is affecting uh, countries all over the world where it, ingredient and packaging suppliers source from. Some countries are shutting down their borders and it's gonna make it very difficult to get the ingredients that you need into this country. Uh, suppliers like Bay State Milling are looking at, well, we may have a supply chain that we bring in from India and that's getting really tight. So we're pivoting to Canada to bring that in for you. But it's still important for you to understand where these things are coming from. Uh, ask questions, make sure that you know, uh, and that if, uh, if you think there's gonna be a, a tight supply, then it's time to think about um, where else you might get that product. So that brings us to the next point of having a backup supplier, especially for critical items. And this is not just um, pandemic advice, this is daily advice that you always wanna make sure that you have a backup supplier. Uh, you may think that you're not big enough to have a backup supplier or that you could split your business, but it's still important to have identified someone 
uh, who you can get the same product from, especially for your critical items in a pinch. The next point here is making sure that distributors have backup suppliers. And that might seem like overkill uh, because oftentimes you can't dictate you know, what your supplier's source is. We're you know, several times removed here. However, it, it does happen that distributors often buy from the same source or the same supply chain. We see that uh, we sell to a number of different suppliers. Uh, we may sell the same cinnamon to a couple of different suppliers to the food industry. And if we have a problem, now you have two distributors who will have a problem. Now you won't have that happen with us because we're doing our, our supply chain backup, but it's just, it can be a very long chain. So asking questions, trying to determine where your food comes from um, and how it goes through that chain is super important. Uh, the essential business, uh, you know, COVID-19 has brought us a lot of new terms in our vocabulary social distancing being a brand new one. Essential business less so, we're kind of used to that, particularly in New England, where we have snowstorms and sometimes only essential businesses are allowed, um, allowed to operate. But in this case, the definition of essential business has changed and we are all in the food industry. We are serving consumers, we are part of that chain and we are essential. So it's important that everyone in your circle knows that you are part of an essential business. And so when they're considering who to supply and how to supply, making sure that that is known is really important and, and your suppliers can leverage that information. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, you have a number of logistics partners that you work with. Some are forward, some are backward. Um, some are bringing things to you, some are picking things up from you and bringing them, you know, to uh, additional locations for sale. And what we're finding is in this state to state situation that we're in where different states have different regulations, uh, sometimes logistics partner may not be able to get from point A to point B. Uh, they're being checked on the roads. Uh, some, in some cases, they may not be able to cross state lines. So what we've done is provide documentation to all of the logistics partners that we work with. We make sure that the truck drivers, the trucking companies have letters from Bay State Milling that say, we're an essential business, this truck is delivering essential materials and they need to be allowed uh, to deliver on those things. Same thing with entering your facility, making sure that they have the proper documentation to enter your facility. Uh, it's just you know, really unique times and, and we have found so far that this is effective. Uh, we've done it for our employees as well because there's also the, the uh, potential that employees may get stopped on their way to work um, and without that documentation that they work for an essential business, they may not be able to make it there. And those are the people who make your businesses run. Uh, next, cash flow. Who hasn't been thinking about this? Um, cash flow is obviously important throughout the entire supply chain. And we know that, um, you know, in, you know, going back to the point A about, um, about forecasting and making sure that supply is meeting demand, sometimes in times like these where you have a product that you know, may not be meeting people's needs right now, and you may be strapped for cash, you may be looking for extended credit terms. Um, trust me, that is happening throughout the supply chain. So it certainly can't hurt to ask um, if you're in a pinch and you need those extended credit terms. But you have to understand that if they're not able to be granted, um, it's probably because your supplier is in the same boat. So uh, cash flow is critical for everybody. We're all dealing with uh, challenges here and it's, it's great to try, but please don't take it personally if your supplier is not able to uh, extend those credit terms. Um, it just means that they're in the same boat. So, Going back to personal relationships, that certainly helps. But in the end, if, if someone has to say no to extending those terms, it's not personal, it's just business. Another thing that we find people struggle with in their supply chains, especially when times get tight, um, is minimum order quantities. If you are just getting started and you know a couple of pallets or a half a truckload is the minimum order quantity from your supplier, Sometimes it's tough to, um, to meet those minimums. And especially going back to the last point about credit terms, if you're strapped for cash, you can't get the credit terms and you can't buy the minimum order quantity, that can be a problem for you. So 
this, this is something that we haven't encountered just yet, but I could see it being an option, is joining forces with people who are locally uh, using similar items. Um, I know Branch Food knows, you know, that your, your network is fantastic. And so if you're finding that you can't uh, pony up for that minimum order, maybe there's someone locally that we can, um, you can be set up with to share a load, uh, especially of common items, if it's uh, cinnamon or sesame seed or flour for that matter. Um, these are the things that we deal in and, you know, they're not that unusual. So there might be someone locally who you can pair up with to share that minimum order quantity. And I ran through those real quick, so I'm already at the, at the last one, but hopefully that leaves some time for questions. Um, you know, I don't know if this is most important or not, but, but we feel it's pretty important is to not give up on innovation during this time. Um, I think a lot of companies are, are really, you know, kind of honing in, bootstrapping, just trying to make sure that the supply and demand is, is meeting what people need today. But we do know that things are gonna get back to normal. At least the optimists in the room uh, are, are knowing that at some point in time, we will return to normal. And people are going to be looking for those new innovative products, something to feel like, okay, I'm, you know, I can take a risk again and I can go out there and I can try new things. And you wanna be prepared with those. So try not to, uh, to get too enclosed on yourself and, and keep your eye on innovation and get creative on how you do it. Uh, some of the ways that we're doing this are to um, do virtual meetings with people. You know, we're working from home, you're working from home, but you're trying to create this new product. What can we do in the kitchen together through video uh, that's instructional um, so that you've got something, as soon as everything turns back to normal, you've got a new product to launch on the shelves. So that is, uh, that's the top 10 list from a food ingredient supplier perspective. Um, hopefully there's some nuggets in here that you can use in your own business. Great. Um, questions? Can you hear me? Oh, hello. Okay. Uh, anyone would like to start us off with questions for Colleen? Thanks for the great presentation, Colleen. If you'd like to ask a question, you're welcome to send it in the chat uh, directly to the host, or um, you can unmute yourself and ask the question right now. We'll experiment with the community open chat. Um, it's been working relatively well so far. So does anyone out there have a question? Hi, this is Suman here. I have a quick question and Colleen, this may relate to some of the products you carry or may not some of the products. Um, I primarily deal in lentils and beans and things like that. And I'm seeing my suppliers already telling me that there may be delays of, you know, six to seven weeks uh, at this point. Um, are you seeing something familiar? And do you expect things to start moving sooner than that? Or should we be thinking about, you know, changing uh, what we are offering right now based on what's available? We are seeing that um, in certain items, uh, particularly, it, it really just depends on the country that they're coming from. Um, India is one area where we have seen um, things starting to slow down, or we've been giving the notice that things are going to slow down. Now, it really depends on how long things will last, uh, but if they're telling you six to seven weeks, you can count on it being at least six to seven weeks. So um, if, if your products are, are in need of that in a shorter period of time, I would definitely recommend looking at, um, potentially looking at different places, different distributors um, or, or suppliers who may already have inventory of those things. And if you can't find that, uh, or if you're being told the same thing, then I would definitely recommend that you pivot um, just because it's very uncertain right now. Thank you. Uh, so we did have one question come through, Colleen, um, from a participant. So uh, as a small startup uh, that doesn't have as many connections as someone that's been in the industry for a while, how do you suggest going about finding suppliers at this time? Good question. Um, you know, there's so many resources online. Um, 
I'm trying, of course, I can't think of their names off the top of my head, but there's, there's a lot of online directories for resources. I mean, I, I'm sure many of you were or are connected or involved with the Natural Product Expo West and East community. Um, you know, if you go on their website and you look at their exhibitor list and, and you look by some of the things that you might be uh, interested in, that's one way to search. Um, food technology, the food master, there's several different databases online that are, um, they're typically paid by the supplier to be part of that network. So um, you can put in keyword searches into many of those databases and they'll give you ideas of who the suppliers are. And then another question that came through is in terms of uh, food inflation, are you seeing that in any way at this point, uh, cost of food prices going up? Um, I'm sure we've all seen a little bit of that, and that may be, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that it has to do with cost of raw materials as much as it may be just opportunity and supply and demand at the, at the consumer end. Um, throughout the supply chain, in terms of raw materials, we have not seen that yet. And, and that may be because a lot of the materials that we are engaged in uh, either have long lead times or are part of the, the commodity hedging uh, cycle. So we haven't seen a lot of changes in the, the cost of the raw materials at this point, um, but where things might be tight uh, at the consumer end, there may be some inflation. Okay, thank you. Any other questions um, from the group for Colleen? I have a question. This is Tina Adelson. Um, how do you recommend that people allocate? So at some point they're going to have sold through the inventory that already was produced and they're going to be able to produce only a limited amount and they're not going to be able to supply every retailer the same way that they would normally or, or, or every other partner, whether it's food service. Do you have any guidance for people on how to go into being on allocation, which is not something that most startups has dealt with in the past? Right. Um, some of the things that we've seen, and I, I could say that this was more with large scale manufacturers who offer many, many, many different SKUs, they are tightening up and focusing on their most popular or their best selling SKUs so that they're not having to do a lot of changeovers and a lot of um, moving from SKU to SKU. Uh, and they're really trying to keep the things that are most popular flowing through, uh, through the retail system. So that's sort of a product uh, allocation, you know, focusing on, on your top sellers would be the product, product allocation. In terms of the retail allocation, um, I have seen some data around, you know, the, the, the retailers who are growing or the re retailers who are slowing and more of the mainstream grocery seems to be, you know, where people are, as people are afraid to venture out, they're not going to too many different stores. So they're heading to the mainstream grocery uh, and not so much the specialty stores, which is unfortunate. Um, but if we had, to, if you had to choose a retailer to focus on, you may want to focus on the mainstream um, channel right now and then you know as soon as things start to normalize again uh, going back to more of the specialty stores where um, you know some of them may not be open now the specialty stores and or people wouldn't know that they're open so mainstream would be a good area to focus on uh, and mainstream products thank you any other questions Okay. All right. Well, uh, Colleen, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing um, those uh, bits of insight into supplier relationships right now and suggestions for how brands can manage those relationships. We really appreciate it. Um, and we know that you're, uh, you're well aware of sort of all the dynamics that are happening right now. And so um, uh, if folks have further questions, we'll, we'll be happy to pass them along to you. Um, and thank you all for, uh, for tuning in today. Um, as a quick reminder, um, we have the series going through April 17th. Um, we have tomorrow's speaker, uh, Nate, 
Berkowitz from um, Pivot Consulting, who will focus on cash flow management, something that's been touched on, I think, in all of our presentations in different ways to date, um, but the focus really being on cash preservation and how to think about managing um, that at that time, at this time. Um, in addition, you can go to branchy.com, serving up support for further information on all of the upcoming speakers um, or email into info at branchfood.com and we will continue to share um, further, uh, further content and um, products and resources that we're putting together for the community at this time. So thank you all for joining. Thank you again, Kathleen, uh, for being part of this and we look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.